very much from a legends basis. Sure. Um, um, and, and fortunately, the time period, uh, you know, facilitates that. Now, did you? So, out of all these characters that you've been writing, I mean, because I got a lot of, I, did, I got a lot of World War Two uh, feeling here with. Uh, you know, with with an, uh, we've always gotten that with the empire, with how the empire had the, had the similarities to the Nazis and to the the, the empire. Uh, but was there? Did you go back to that when writing Galen Erso, obviously being the scientist that was just wants for his research. It was all about about trying to do the greater good and yet being pulled and and manipulated really to serve for the greater evil of the empire. Did you pull a lot from history? Uh. What I, yeah, I did uh, in the sense that um, I did a lot of research on the Manhattan Project. Right. Because it just seemed uh, appropriate. Um, I don't, I didn't come across any um, scientists in the 40s who were like um, Erso and uh, rejected the, the call to duty. Right. Uh, so I started to uh, look at some other historical figures in order to uh, give me some idea of what I wanted to do with Galen. Um, but there is that there is that World War II feeling in the sense that um, the United States uh, and and Britain were very worried that the that Nazi Germany was developing an atomic bomb, and uh, so that that spearheaded the the whole Manhattan Project, and so I drew a lot from that. Sure, yeah, and you can, I mean you could feel it, and I think that. While looking at it, it's funny that you, when you mentioned that the story group wanted you to because he had just written Tarkin. Man, you love writing Tarkin. You write him so well. Uh, he, he, I can, I just, I just hear Peter Cushing when I'm reading. It just pops off the page. He's got a really big role in this book. Were you happy? And how happy are you when you're writing uh, this legendary character? Uh, I, I, I loved putting Tarkin and Krennic together. Because yeah. Because they have, uh, they have very different ways of uh, going about getting, you know, what their needs met. Um, Krennic is. Uh, sort of a real gambler mentality and really um, uh, has a way of finding people's tells. Let me turn that No off. problem, Sorry. no problem. It's a good ring. Um, yeah, so I, I love bringing, uh, you know, I, and I think they're very different in the way they operate and in their uh, intelligence and everything else, so it was great to put the two of them together on the page. Yeah, and so when you're, as where I'm hearing Peter Cushing's voice, and you said, you know, you're, you're looking at, you're reading, uh, you're reading scripts, and, and at, at what, did you know, like, the casting from last November, did you did you know who was who, and, and if so, do, are you able to look at a Maz Mikkelsen and say, okay, I know his work, or do you do research into looking at his work and, and kind of write in his voice, or you just take the character in a different direction and, and you know, see what happens um, there? No, I, I did, I, actually, I thought that Mads was going to be the villain. Oh, <laughs> I wow. Had, I had it backwards in the beginning. Um, I mean, I knew that, I knew how, how it had been cast, but I thought he was going to be Krennic. Um, but yeah, I do that. I um, once I understood who was who was cast in what role. I um, looked at movies and tried to get a sense of uh, how the actors operate. Of course, in, in Catalyst, you know, I had to be dealing with younger versions of uh, of those those sure. characters. So sure. um, I stop at a certain point, and just try and um, absorb as much as I can about their diction or the way oh, they. Uh, bodies or whatever and then just go from that now one of the things and this is uh and i and i told people i tweeted about this and i i one there's a reveal in the book that a particular character can sense the force can can feel the force not necessarily force sensitive can't use the force that particular choice now is that something that you come up with or is that something that sometimes the story group says hey maybe maybe this particular character should do this how, how does that work how does that pitch happen um i th i'm going back to the earliest meetings i think we had decided that it would be great if um well lira in this case yeah uh, was not you know force sensitive but just um and i don't want to say worship the but was Student? in touch with it on some level, you know, whether it was an artistic level or just because she had spent so much time in nature that she, you know, she just um, understood that there was something greater going on. And, and who knows how much of it was intellectual or emotional, but uh, she's definitely um, 
well, we don't use the word religion really, do we, much in Star Wars? But I mean, in some sense, she she her she felt her life was guided by the Force. Sure, and I mean, you certainly do feel a religious thing when it comes to the Jedi. I mean, even even the way I mean, the, considering that there's an actual religion now that is <laughs> that they do, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, I mean, you feel that religious feel. I mean, even going back with the the monks and with the hoods and and whatnot, but you you certainly felt that with Lyra the way that she really held true to what the Jedi, the way that they preserved the Force, and she was almost, because we're not going to have a voice for them in Rogue One, at least, you know, we're, it looks like we're going to have Donnie Yen for the most part, and I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen, or where where the Urso family is going to go, but it's set up so well to where, there was, there's a particular scene in this book to where Jen, or, uh, excuse me, Galen Urso and Krennic, are sitting together, and Urso thinks he's going to be able to kind of persuade him to say, "Let's do this together. Come on, let's let's be buddies." And in and I could picture, I really could picture Mendelssohn for that second. I picture him going, "Should I? Nah, I like being evil." It's like those those scenes. It's just like, can you kind of take me through the relationship of Urso and Krennic and how you kind of came to develop like the, the the dynamic between those two because it's so important in this and it's are certainly going to be so important in rogue one yeah i mean there, there was a lot of discussion early on about um how much galen was going to know about the death star or if he was going to know about it at all um but once um it was sort of decided that uh galen was going to be manipulated it gave me a better handle on uh, Krennic and what Krennic was going to have to do to um, lure Galen into a project um, without giving him the full story. Yeah. Um, that scene you're referring to was probably the last scene I wrote in the book. Wow. I don't know why it just uh, get, just um, occurred to me that Galen would be you know would would want to try and um, bring this sort of old acquaintance, this old friend of his, out of the military into something much more worthwhile. And so um, I was happy the way that turned out. Yeah, me too. Uh, and I think that, so there's and another another character that we, his people have been wondering, will how much Rogue One tie-ins are there in this book? Another character that does certainly make its way in is Saw Gerrera. Now, Saw has, and I, I thought when he popped in there, I'm like, oh, he'll be in here for a scene, but he's got a pretty nice role in this also. Now, how much of Saw Gerrera did you know about? Uh, maybe because, because obviously, when when writing Tarkin, you I assume went back and watched episodes of the Clone Wars because there's there's certainly references to the Clone Wars episodes in in Tarkin, but there's certainly a lot of those in this book. Uh, how much did you know about Saw going in, and and what did you find yourself learning about him as you wrote this novel? Uh, originally, I wanted to use. Um saw to an even greater extent hmm. uh, then there was some discussion that saw shouldn't be in the book that he that he should be developed in um, other Rogue One uh, projects then uh, some of the um, people directly involved with the film decided that they definitely wanted saw to make an appearance at the end of the novel hmm. and then in the rewrites um I was uh, given permission to to bring him in uh, to an even greater extent. Um, I didn't see any footage of him, and I didn't um, understand what he sounded like in, mm. in the film. So I had a little bit of help with that um, in just finding the voice of uh, again this younger version of the character that we'll see. So when you're when you are, that's interesting. So when you're when you hear that when you're, when you're writing, you don't know what the character's gonna sound like, and then they cast Forrest Whitaker. You're like, wait a minute, you have Forrest Whitaker, and I can't write like, okay, well, come on. Right. Yeah, I can see he that. Had, he had to be big on the page. Yeah. That was the main thing. He had he had to come in, uh, you know, like a, a small uh, storm front. Sure. Yeah, and 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 it, it was it was felt there for sure. And with you know, you say something here that when you're talking about this. Uh, the story group and certain people saying with people coming in to be how careful you have to be about certain things you can and cannot put in i'm sure that when you go back and, you, and whether it's the part of the, i know that you wrote two out of the three of the dark lord uh trilogy there if if you like when you're going back you write those books the millennium falcon book or even uh, with plagueis 
was there was there far less involvement back then um, than there is now, which I would assume so because of all this kind of story, the story group and story elements. And do you find it more helpful or sometimes maybe a little bothersome because it's like you said, it's like, oh, I was going to write this, but now I can't because of X. Uh, from, from my earliest involvement with, with the franchise, going all the way back to 2000, there has always been sort of a form of the story group. I mean, we, we always used to meet uh, editors and writers and we'd uh, trade ideas and um, um, it really it really hasn't changed much. I, I mean, I, the personnel have changed and um, there are um, more voices involved than there were, uh, you know, 15 years ago. Sure. But uh, the process remains the same. That, that, uh, and it's one thing that I've really liked about working in Star Wars is that uh, it feels very collaborative. It feels almost like um, working on a film script or working on a television show rather than uh, simply, you know, being isolated and writing a novel on my own. Right, I mean, and you can feel that too, because even like the, the references from in Tarkin in this book, and it is like a kind of continuing story all the way through. And even if you were going to write something that takes place thirty years in the past, I'm sure there's still ways for you to kind of connect things. And and you even kind of did that in Tarkin with uh, you know the the droid it, it, from Plagueis. So I mean, there there's there's ways to do that. Like you said, you pull from from legends. Um, I mean, I have to ask, and I'm sure it's a question you get all the time in regards to the Plagueis novel. Are, are there ever meetings to where you're like, "Come on, guys, let's 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 make this thing, let's make this thing can, let's take things here." What 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 are we doing with Plagueis? Is there a way to make Plagueis, or they're kind of holding back to do some reveals down the line, and maybe in a in 10, 15 years, we'll we'll see it, we'll see a Plagueis novel. <laughs> you know. Um... I think it's just an ongoing discussion. Yeah. And, and I really, you know, I, I haven't pushed hard to do that. I mean, I think, you know, Plagueis is out there for anybody that wants to read it, and, and they can they can take the book as uh, as legends or as canon, depending on their own, you know, whatever their own viewpoint is. So I haven't pushed one way, one way or another. And, and uh, it's hard to know in the future, like, which way characters are going to be um, developed in yeah. the continuity. So well, maybe some things will be used, some things won't. That's the way it is. Sure. Um, and, you know, and I, before we started recording, I had mentioned to you about one of the things I liked about that novel so well, and I felt elements of that in Catalyst, was there was like a gangster feel in in Plagueis. I mean, there certainly was. There were scenes I felt like sh- was like ripped out of The Sopranos in some parts. Uh, but, like, there is, when I, when I'm, when I hear the type of strategist that Krennic is, and I look at the middle, even his thought process at one point is like, well, can I get rid of this person without anyone noticing? It's like that type of thing. Is this just something that you like? Have you were you are you a big uh, like are you a big mob guy? Whether it be a Scorsese films or, or or the Godfather films, are there things that you pull from cinematically? Because I certainly can see it when I'm reading your work. I'm a big fan without being an actual mob guy. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Everybody uses. Everyone calls me uh, James Luciano or Luciano. <laughs> but um, yes, I, I am a fan. I'm a fan of all that stuff, and um, uh, you know, maybe it's my uh, my heritage somehow. But um, uh, yeah, I, I read all those things, and I like stories about uh, smugglers and pirates and mobsters yeah. and uh, characters of that elk. So uh, a couple more questions before I let you go here. Out of the new movies that are coming up, obviously you're going to be looking forward to seeing Rogue One, I assume, but uh, when it comes to Episode Eight and Han Solo, is there anything in particular that you're really looking to A, uh, C on the big screen, or B, knock on the story group's uh, uh, door and say, hey, uh, how about this one? I am looking forward to the, um, the Han Solo uh, separate story standalone um i i i want i want to see if that can be pulled off properly yeah uh, without uh you know without our favorite actor involved um and uh you know i i still in the back of my mind think there's another um novel about sidious uh that can be written uh that would take place during the original trilogy don't you tease me uh, don't you tease me i don't know you know, with Snoke and everybody around now, I'm not sure whether he's he will be overshadowed overshadowed in some sense, but I, I still think there's something to uh, dig into there. Oh, there are absolutely, and if, if if you need me to shout to the heavens, I will do that. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, you wrote Palpatine so well. I was funny. I interviewed um, Tom Hiddleston at 
uh, Comic Con this year, and I had said to him, I, I was like, we need you for a young Palpatine film. Like, to me, that would be a young Palpatine is a movie because I want to know more about it because I want to learn more about exact. I thought that the way you set it up in Plagueis of how he became to be was so great. That's why I ask if there's going to be more development there. Now, whether you said, you know, you look at that story as a separate story and then you start to take over um, a story about Palpatine during that time or maybe, at, like you said, afterwards because you wrote because he's certainly in there for Tarkin. Um, in a bit, and you you like writing him. So it's, if you could get your hands on a Palpatine novel next, if they said to you next, hey, we want you to do Palpatine, that's certainly something that you'd be up for. Absolutely, I'd be up for it. I, I just think that, um, you know, during Empire Strikes Back, I I have to wonder what what he was thinking, yeah. what he was doing, what his, what his plan was, while, uh, while things seemed to be... Um, unraveling at the edges well you know and i want to see that too now especially after catalyst because the question would be how if, if they took from all the stuff that's happening on genosis and all the stuff from from the time that and by the way the fact that you started off in clone wars leading up to uh episode four to you sir um but like the the fact that how long if it took that long if it took that long for all that stuff to happen what was the process how did they expedite so so quick how are they able to do that from episode four up until Return of the Jedi to get th that that model done also. So that might be something I assume would be explored. Right, right. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there, there's lots of material left there. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I hope someday um, <laughs> yeah. I'll get another shot at it. Nothing in the works right now, though, as far as another no, Star Wars I mean, novel goes? this really just wrapped up in, okay. um, in September. Okay. So um, nothing, nothing going on. All right, well, James Lucino here, guys. Catalyst, you can get it now, and I know I'm getting the tweets. I'm glad so many of you guys have been getting it. It is worth the read. James, is there anywhere that uh, people can come find you and buy some of your other works uh, if, they, if they're if they not familiar with your work besides uh, Catalyst and other stuff? Uh, you know, no no tour for this book, okay. um, but, um, you know, my email address is out there if anybody wants to contact me and... Uh, you know, my books are all on Amazon if anybody wants to check out any of my other stuff. All right, well, make sure you do it. He is one of the best. It is James Lucino. And James, are you going to be at uh, Celebration this uh, this year? Do you know? I hope so. I hope so, too. I'd love to see you again. And, yeah, again, please, please, again, please, again yeah, please please join us once uh, you're next. Now, once, once the Palpatine novel comes out, we'll talk again. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. It was a pleasure talking to you. It really Thanks. was. Thank you.